Today, I had the honor of speaking with Vienna Farron, a licensed marriage and family therapist in New York, where she treats individuals, couples, and families in a clinic setting. I just finished reading Vienna's book, The Origins of You, How Breaking Family Patterns Can Liberate the Way We Live and Love. It is a profound guide to understanding and overcoming wounds from your family of origin. You know, I read a lot of relationship books. I read about one a week, and this book has had a lasting impact on me. I have been doing a deep dive into my own wounds and working to change unwanted patterns in my close relationships, and we can all benefit from Vienna's work. I hope our conversation inspires you to read her book and begin healing old wounds, which in turn can help improve the quality of relationships and the quality of your life. Enjoy. Welcome to Let's Talk Love, the podcast that brings you real talk, fresh ideas, and expert insights every week. Our guests are the most trusted voices in love and relationships, and they're here for you with tools, information, and friendly advice to help you expand the ways you love, relate, and communicate. We tackle the big questions, not shying away from the complex, the messy, the awkward, and the joyful parts of relationships. I'm your host, Robin Ducharme. Now, let's talk love. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Love. I am so very excited and honored to have our guest today, Vienna Farron of Mindful MT. And welcome, Vienna! Thank you, Robin! <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Such a lovely introduction. And yeah, I know it's been a long time coming for us. It really, it really has. And Vienna, I know you had said you are releasing your book. And by the time this episode comes out, your book has been released. And Ooh. I feel very privileged to have received a copy before it's out in the world. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's, there's a number of us that have had the, the honor of reading your book, but I just want to say that it, it was an, incre it's an incredible book. Thank you. And I'm excited to dive into it today. Um, it's called The Origins of You. And those are there that are watching this on YouTube, you're going to be able to, um, you have to get a copy because I love, I love listening to books mm -hmm. and having the real copies so that I can highlight, make notes, of course, refer back. Um, but I do recommend somebody that people have the paper copy because mm -hmm. it's like, it really is a deep dive. And I was telling, um, my friends and family about reading this book and I'm like, Oh, oh no, there's no such thing as speed reading this book. You got to no. take your time. Like this That's is it. healing work and this is deep. It's yeah. deep work. Yeah. So yeah. first I want to congratulate you really, Vienna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciate the kind words. It's so nice to start getting feedback on the book outside of my editor or legal being like, okay, we have to change this. Or we have to do this. It's, yes. I, I love that it's um, slowly dripping out into the world. And obviously February 21st is when it actually hits everyone else. Wow. Um, but you're right. It's a, um, I, I hope that the reader or the listener, if people are going to listen to it on audiobook, um, feels really held by me throughout because yes. it is such a heavy lift. But my hope is that it feels like a safe exploration and but like a necessary one, right? One that we all really need to dive into. Um, I agree. I felt that way. I felt very yeah. held by you. I felt very supported. Um and it's something like you, you do refer, you go back to the fact that this is a process. Of mm -hmm. course it is. Our, like our, li our, our healing is lifelong. And, and this is not, um, like, you know, I, like this is why I'm like, oh, thank goodness I have this, the copy in, you know, in print because yeah. I have to, like, I'm already, I already know I, I've identified some of my wounds for sure. Yeah. And I have more than one, which I was mm -hmm. like, Ooh, cause so let's yeah. just dive into talking about it. Okay. Let's more. do it. Let's do okay, it. Okay. So this, so your book is called the origins of you and how breaking family patterns can liberate the way we live and love. So your body of work, a lot that you focus on in your therapy work with clients, individuals and couples mm -hmm. is family of origin work. Yes. Correct. So, yes. so Vienna, can you please, for those that don't know you and aren't, and aren't following you yet, can you please give us a background on, on how you got into focusing on this, this body of work and how important this is with clients and really how that, how that 
blossomed in your career sure. um, and why it's so important. Yeah, yeah, of course. So my, I, I went to school for marriage and family therapy. So I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, and yeah, that training is really focused on understanding the systems that we grew up in and how those mm -hmm. systems shape us, right? And so of course, yes. one of the first systems that we look at is our family of origin family, right? If we just want mm -hmm. to shorten it, right? The family that you grew yep. up around. And for some of us, that might be one family. For for others of us, that might be two or multiples. Um, we might think about um, parents, step-parents, uh, sometimes grandparents. You know, you notice mm -hmm. like who kind of comes into that system and, and is part of your childhood. Um, some of it is blood-related and some of it is not. And we have to explore how these systems not only shape us and teach us about the world at large, about ourselves, about relationships, um, but also the wounds. And you, you alluded to it before when you said I have more than one, but also the wounds that we accrue during this time. I focus deeply on understanding our family system, uh, what those relationships were growing up, how they've evolved, what's changed. Um, some of it is between you and those people and others. Uh, other times the focus is around the people you observed, right? So sometimes it's through experience that we learn th things and other times mm -hmm. it's through observation that we learn things. And so, yeah, this deep dive into family systems work is vital. And I know sometimes people roll their eyes and yes. they're like, I'm unaffected by it. Like there's nothing bad there. I don't want to go backwards in order yep. to go forwards. And I get it. I get it. I know, uh, of course, so many clients come into therapy and they're like, here's the thing I want to focus here's the on. Issue. Here's the issue at hand. Yep. And listen, I was that person at one point too. So I, I think we all it. have been there. We all I, are. I'm, We're like, I, I've, I've done so much therapy and it's just like, this is the issue. No, yeah. no, no. It's, it's deeper than that. And that's what totally. just, <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. So it's like, here's this gentle guy to say, Hey, could we just turn our heads around for a little bit? I don't want to stay here forever. This is not a book about bashing parents or throwing no. people under the bus or anything like that. This is a book that says, let's understand how the past is with us right now, because I promise you it is sometimes in really obvious ways, sometimes in really subtle ways, but the past is is running the show if you are an adult right now who has any unwanted pattern in your life i promise you that looking backwards is going to really support in opening this up and finding a path forward wow yes i i i'm already starting to experience it vienna so i'm like this is powerful stuff i love it so much <laughs> yes. it's not easy but it's so good <laughs> So, it's not easy. Uh, so you start the book by telling your story about when you were five years old and you had an experience with your parents that really, what you say, um, it, it really ignited uh, or start, formed your safety wound. So there's different mm -hmm. types of wounds. We're going to go into that, yeah. but can you, can you tell the listeners about that? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my parents got separated when I was in first grade. They went through a nine year divorce process, which was the longest in the state of New Jersey at the yeah, time. That is such a long time. It's a long time. Um, yeah. And their separation process into the divorce process um, was highly conflictual. Uh, there was a lot of psychological abuse, manipulation, gaslighting, paranoia, emotional flooding. Like it was really, really hard to be around and to watch and experience. I am also an only child, and I share that detail because I was this tiny little human existing mm -hmm. in this in this system really by herself, right? There was no other sibling where I could say, Hey, oh my gosh, this is what's, can you believe what's going on? Yes. I didn't have any other adults in my life in terms of, you know, neither one of my parents ever repartnered or remarried. And so there was no step parent or partner, um, who could be a source of grounding or clarity mm -hmm. for me. And so as a tiny human going through this experience, right, it's just like, I was in it by myself and, yeah, I, I share this story at the beginning of the book about this massive rupture uh, that took place in my family, really the initiation into the separation and, and the divorce. And 
the fear that, um, you know, there's an acute moment where I'm running from my grandmother's home to the neighbor's home because my dad is on the way over um, after he told us if we had left the house, you know, not to come back and, you know, find myself hiding in a closet with my mom as he and uh, police officers come to the, the neighbor's door. And, you know, I remember this moment being in the closet and I think there was a moment before where I was like peeking over the, the windowsill and I could see my dad from afar kind of circling my grandmother's home and you know, just wanting, sort of really feeling split, right? Like, hey, dad, I'm right here. And yes. then also with my mom, like, oh, shoot, we're, we're scared and yes. we're, you know, existing in this moment and I need to, to quiet down. And yeah, this, this splitting moment of how do I protect both of them. You know, how do I care for both of them? How do they both know that I love each of them mm -hmm. equally? And yeah, this was sort of this, this big rupture at such an early age. And as I said before, they really moved into a highly conflictual place with each other. And so from there, I sort of, I took on this role of flying under the radar, being the peacekeeper, saying the things that I thought both of them needed to hear in order to make sure that the operation kept on functioning. I really believed that they were, you know, one hair away from, from just crumbling, crashing and burning. I say they were crashing and burning in the system around me. And so it left me feeling like there wasn't room for me to not be okay. They were not okay. Clearly I could see that. And so I was, so really you had afraid. to be okay. Yeah. Right. I moved into this space of presenting like I was okay. Yeah. And listen to this, to this day, you know, I, I, it's, I don't know that that was necessarily true that I couldn't be okay. Maybe there would have been room for me, but the, yeah. but the point is that I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I became this person who presented, I was a little girl who was sort of a needless little girl who was always saying everything was fine and I'm good. And I, I, got good at anything I put my mind to, to relieve as much stress as possible. But that little girl turned into a woman um, who was also a needless woman, a woman who kept saying that things were fine when they weren't, who had zero boundaries, um, who pretended like things were I pretended like I was unaffected by things that I was affected by because I just didn't know how to transition out of this role that I had carried with me for decades. Wow. Yeah. I, it's just, it's so, um, this is, there was just so many realizations in this book, Vienna, and we'll go into this, but I just think that in itself, it's like you are, um, it's all this whole thing about adapting in this role mm -hmm. that you were put in. It was totally mm -hmm. out of your control. It was going on between your parents and right. how understanding all of that brings you into your adulthood. Whereas those same behaviors, they become like, we you know it's like maladaptive, right? That's Absolute, the term right. I, I'm mm -hmm. thinking of, but it's like, you don't know that you're not mm -hmm. consciously acting this way. And that's, and that's where I think there's, there's so much learning and healing to be done. Um, and I just, I love how you teach it in the book. Um, because I mean, obviously I, I would love for you to be my therapist and walk me through this, right? But a lot of people can't, they don't have, they don't have that. Um, they don't have the therapist they can work with, but this book really gives you the tools to go through and identify and name it like you're, and we'll go through all the steps that, that you can go through. Yeah. Um, so, so then you went to therapy yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you said you saw how a finite experience that happened decades ago, and it wasn't, it was that one experience that spurred it on, but obviously, mm -hmm. which is the, you know, the culmination of all those years and yeah. living, going through the nine year divorce separation with your parents, mm -hmm. all of that just kind of reinforces this, these thought patterns, these behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you said, I had attempted to ignore the original wound that had shattered my sense of safety and to sidestep the resulting pain. Mm -hmm. Um, so this work, yeah, go ahead. I, I was going to say, this is what so many of us try to do. We yes. minimize yes. or distort yep. or invalidate our experiences. And listen, I was this person who walked into grad school saying my parents divorce didn't affect me and bless, bless the professors and yeah. advisors, <laughs> supervisors who was like, Oh, this it's sweet, impossible, sweet right? woman. Um, and to find, but, but to, to acknowledge the pain required me to come into contact with the truth that I wasn't fine. 
And that was so hard for me because for so many decades, that's what I had taught myself to believe. And it felt really overwhelming at a point to be like, I'm not okay. This did affect me. There's so much vulnerability in that, but then there's all of the emotion that comes to the surface that wants to then be processed. And so I fully understand why people don't necessarily want to lean into this work, right? Where it's like, well, I'm okay. I'm a fully functioning adult. I'm doing okay in the world. Like why dig this up? And Again, I was there before, but we dig this up because it, the pain comes with us. It finds a way. There's a point in the book where sure I'm like, our wounds are not out to harm us. They are out to be healed, right? They're tugging yes. at our shirts. They're just like, hey, please, because our wounds will find a way to resurface. They'll find a way to um, show us the pattern over and over again. And when we just try to brute force our way through, or when we try to say like, oh, I'm going to skip over the stuff that was so long ago. Why is it even relevant today? Is that it is right. Like to tend to the origin wound, right? The pain that set the framework for whatever it is that we're dealing with today. We must go back into that space. We can't just tend to what's showing up today because otherwise we're bypassing the original pain, right? We're bypassing whether it's the, for me, the five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old me who wanted to be acknowledged, who needed to be seen, who needed to know that there was space to feel whatever emotion that was there for her. But it's so easy and it's so common to want to skip over it, to avoid it. Um, I often say, cannot avoid your way to healing, right? We can certainly use discernment. We must, we really need to, but we can't avoid our way to healing. Right? We have to get to that origin pain, that origin wound uh, to really tend to it properly. We at Real Love Ready are so excited to be hosting In Bloom, a love and relationship summit, April 14th and 15th, 2023 in Vancouver, BC. Join us for an insider pass to the most trusted relationship expertise an intimate weekend of in-person or virtual learning, growth, and community. We're bringing you the insights and tools you need to learn and bloom in your relationships. Head over to realloveready.com to learn more and get your tickets. We truly hope to see you there. You do say that um, you've yet to meet a person who doesn't have some kind of origin wound. Mm -hmm. This is, this, and and, you know, Something that you do talk about, which I think you were saying this too, when you walked into grad school, you're like, Mm -hmm. you were like almost idealizing. It's not idealizing your childhood. You were like, okay, I was good. I wasn't affected. It was because of my parents. It was was between Mm -hmm. them. Like I'm good. Right. (laughs) Right? Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of people uh, would would welcome into your office maybe and just say like, I'm good. Like I had Mm -hmm. a great childhood. My parents Mm -hmm. are still married. They're still like, they're in a loving relationship. Um, And they, they don't want to, like you say in the book, you say they don't want to feel disloyal Mm -hmm. or unappreciative of the care and love that they had as a child growing up. Um, or their wound compares, they're comparing their wound to other people. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. other people had it way worse. Their yeah. childhood was way worse than mine and I'm good. So let's talk about that on just mm-hmm. like, it may not, it, this is, this doesn't mean that you have to had, had to have had the worst childhood or gone through right. a very terrifying experience. Like you went through Vienna. Right. Right. Um, but it's like acknowledging that, yeah, there, 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 there is inevitably going to be some wounding that you're going to, you can become aware of. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we are allowed to have great parents, right? It's, and that's yes. what it's like, we're not searching <laughs> we're not for, you know, we're not on the hunt to find something wrong with, you know, with this experience. But the reality of it is, is that if your parents are human, right? Then they're flawed, right? Then they, they're not going to get everything right all of the time. Um, and so, yeah, again, this isn't about throwing the adults under the, the bus. This is about naming and connecting to the thing that was hurtful, the thing that caused pain, the thing that caused wounding. Certainly some people have trauma. Um, you know, you hear some people's stories and you're like, oh my gosh, 
right? Like the weight of that. And we know that other people have stories that look nothing like that. And you're right. The, the, the wound comparison, you know, so many people do that as a way to avoid naming what they went through. They sort of feel Mm -hmm. embarrassed or guilty. Like so-and-so has this terrible story. I would feel ridiculous, right? Complaining about this little thing that happened in my life. But that's the thing that takes us away. It's a distraction away from that which needs to be healed. And so I, I tell people sort of to just exist in your own experience. This is not about anybody else other than you and being able to name that and shed a little bit of light on what that pain was is going to start carving out the path forward. You can absolutely have had a really great childhood, but again, like I said in the book, I have yet to meet someone. So if you're out there, let me know. Yeah. But I have yet to meet someone who doesn't carry around some type of pain, some type of, I wish this had been different. I That's wish right. that, right. It's like, and to really tune into that because the, I wish this had been different is probably showing up in some way. Currently yes. Too. And so, and so that's one of the questions that you ask. That's one of the first mm-hmm. questions that you ask. If, okay, let's say a couple comes in or person, let's say a couple comes in sure. and they're like, okay, we just, we just cannot communicate. It's just not working out. Like we, we fight over the same thing over and over again. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's the issue at hand. Um, but you're going to flip that upside down and be like, mm-hmm. let's go deeper here. Yep. And one of the questions you, you say is what you most wanted was, what was, mm-hmm. what you most wanted in your family system, but didn't get was likely Mm -hmm. something you really could have used. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. yeah, you give examples of, and this is like some of the, the, where the wounds are naming, right? You Mm -hmm. say, Mm -hmm. maybe you wanted to feel worthy, even when you weren't bringing home perfect grades, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you wanted to belong and feel accepted and loved for your differences. Mm-hmm. And you give an example in your book. And I, lo- I love the fact that you shared um, anonymous stories about your mm-hmm. clients that you've helped. Um, and there was one client that you helped who was gay and mm-hmm. his family was very religious and, mm-hmm. and they, they pretty much shunned him in the house. Right. It was just yeah. like, and it wasn't just, it was the parents and the siblings. It was like, mm-hmm. we're, you're not allowed to be gay. So mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is a, I mean, that feeling of acceptance and the worthiness that yeah. um, you you're just don't feel worthy or safe mm-hmm. in your own home. There's a lot of yeah. wounding that can go along There's with that. There's a lot of wounding, right? <laughs> Worthiness, belonging, safety. Yes, belonging. Trusting, you know, trusting people, the people yep. you love the most in the world and the people who you think are, are supposed to love you the most in the world and having that be something that's ruptured. Um, yeah, that question, that prompt is such a powerful one, right? Like, what is it that you yes. wanted most as a child and didn't get? And I remember when a therapist asked me that question, I was like, oh boy, okay, yeah, right. Like, I wanted to know that it was okay for me to not be okay, right? Yes. And like, I needed to know that, right? I needed mm-hmm. that to be more explicit, right? Because the way that I was showing up in the world, you know, it was, it was working for them. Right. It was working for them. Uh, no one. I mean, most parents like an easygoing child. Right. Most parents like a, a child who is doing well in different areas of their of their school, their extracurriculars, whatever it is. And and so I had found this way of of coping with it. But I really wanted to know that it was OK for me to not be OK. I had a full emotional experience during that time that I would say neither one of them really understood deeply. Mm -hmm. And I wish that that had been the case. I think that question, you know, even for listeners right now to take a moment to say like, what did I wish for the most? What did I crave for as a child, the most that I didn't get? Mm -hmm. And as it comes, as we come into the, the wounds, right? It might be like, I wished that I knew that I was good enough for a parent. I wish I didn't have to be quote unquote perfect in order to be loved. I wish that I didn't have to perform or be the type of 
child that my mom wanted me to be in order for there to be peace in the house. I wish that I was a priority to a parent who was working endless hours and seemed to never have time for me. I wish yes. that people cared about my emotional well-being and created a safe environment in the home instead of constantly screaming and yelling at each other. You know, the, the, the answers are endless, right? But to tune into what is it that you wish that you craved is going to bring you um, closer and closer to understanding where you might spend some time in the origin healing process. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So let's get into the wounds, Vienna. So sure. um, there are five, correct? Yes. I, I, I speak okay. of five in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the first, um, the first one that I wrote down was worthiness wound. I want to feel worthy. Mm -hmm. And so how does this, and, and, and actually you said the more time I spend with people, the more I'm convinced that we all have some type of worthiness wound. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that this is true on, on many, on many levels. And this is why, like, you know, there's, there's so much in social media or memes, whatever else about like, you, and, and you know, if you're talking about self-love and self-care a lot about like you, are you, do you feel worthy? Are you, yeah. and we're looking for that worthiness from somebody else. Maybe mm -hmm. we didn't get that in, in mm -hmm. some way, um, in our fam, in our families. Yeah. Yeah. So can right. you give the us worthy... examples of worthiness wounds and how they operate, yeah. how, how people yeah. might operate from this wounded place? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the word, I, I do think that probably all of us brush up against it at minimum at some point mm -hmm. in our lives, right? Am I worthy? Am I deserving? Am I good enough? And, um, you know, this is, one of the examples that I give in the book is about a woman who's, um, she shares that when she was quite young, her, her mom left, her mom left the, the family. It was her father yeah. and her sister. And the, the one day the mom just says, this isn't good for me. And she gets in a car yes. uh, with a friend of hers and drives off. And the client talks about how she like what else besides it being related to me, right? Cause she said, um, this isn't good for mama. That's what the mom said when she left. And so she and her sister had really internalized that as, yep. as, okay, there's something it must have been wrong. Me. It must have been it us. It had to be us, right? Because what else is it? You gave no other explanation. And of course, yeah. as, again, as tiny humans, right? Our brains are not able to process things differently, right? We, we personalize things. And so of course, right, when we have these childhood experiences, it is, is something that we internalize as being problematic with us. And, and so this is a great example of, okay, I believe that I am undeserving, unworthy um, of people sticking around, of people loving me, of people staying with me. Fast forward, here's this woman who finds ways to push partners away um, even before they want to exit a relationship, right? She finds ways to test yes. and push and, you know, sabotage and listen, sabotage is a protective mechanism, but we still engage in sabotage and, and really ending relationships because at the core of it, right? We're, we still believe that we are unworthy, undeserving of being loved, chosen, having a, having somebody commit to us and on and on and on. And, when and we she started, would, and she would test, she would test them in the fact that she would put demands on her yes. partner, on people she was dating. Like, yes. um, I need you to pick this up for me. I need you to do my laundry or pick up my dry cleaning, <laughs> yeah. doing mm -hmm. like doing a lot of chores, like asking. Yeah. Yes. Tasking, asking people. And then if they didn't follow through on something, she'd become really passive aggressive and punish them. And this, you know, obviously that's something that people don't like, and it does push people away, but she had never spent time talking about her family of origin. She had never yes. spent time no. in therapy, really connecting to and feeling into and really grieving the pain of when her mom left. And we started to see how this worthiness origin wound was running the show in her adult romantic relationships because at her core, because she had never tended to this wound, right? That wound was essentially running rampant and it yes. was pushing people away and making great relationships end prematurely because she didn't believe that she could receive that. And so we had to work to really tend to that pain, to start to make space for there to be a different story, right? It's, it's um, <clears throat> sort of that 
it's kind of this fulfilling prophecy, right? As we talk self-fulfilling prophecies of like, yes, I don't believe so I'm deserving. And so I'm going to do things to really make sure that that message gets repeated to me over yes. and over and over again, right? It was easy for her when relationships would end for her to, you know, fold her arms across her chest and say, see, I'm not worthy. See, people leave always, right? Yep, Instead this of is, This is the way it's always been. Yeah, exactly. Right. So instead of getting back into the driver's seat to say, okay, there's something that needs tending to here in order for me to really heal this wound more. Right. And it doesn't mean that we heal and then we're done. Right. Grief will show up over and over and over again. Yes. But it's, you know, to tend to it more and more so that it's not running the show is really the goal that we're aiming for. Yes. And one of the steps in healing, which we, I'm hopefully we have time to go through, but if not, you just, you'd have to get the book no matter what, um, (laughs) but is grieving. And I think this is, um, you know, you, you are, you're making, you're, you're naming so that there's awareness Mm -hmm. you're and you are witnessing and mm-hmm. grieving is so important. And I think this is um, so similar to, you know, losing someone you love. Yeah. Grieving is something you cannot bypass. Mm-hmm. And in the same sense with this woman that you're talking about, she, she literally lost her childhood. I mean, mm-hmm. she was forced to almost become like this adult in a, such a, she was, she was without a mom. Right. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and then, Oh, it's just so sad. But I mean, you think about it and you can understand Mm -hmm. how she, without, without actually looking at that and grieving everything she'd gone through, it's like a part of herself that she had to reclaim. Yeah. And some of the other, like some, some of the other ways that it can show up. If you are a people pleaser, if, or if you are a perfectionist, um, if you're a performer, right. If you had any experiences in your childhood where it was like, okay, I need to be X, whatever X is a great student, a phenomenal athlete. I need to be, um, a bit more quiet. I need to be a bit more of this. You know, if you had those experiences that made you realize like, okay, I am more loved. I am more accepted. I am more, there's more peace in my home. There's more calm in my home when I do X, Y, and Z. A lot of times that's wrapped up in worthiness, right? I am worthy of my dad's attention when I perform well on the soccer field. I am worthy of my mom's love when I have the type of body she wants me to have. I am right. And, and so we really tune into some of these things where worthiness can really start to get, um, picked at, right. Where it's like, ah, there's something conditional here. And I talk about conditional love in the worthiness chapter, um, very quickly. I know we want to get to, you know, all of the wounds, but one of the things that I had realized personally is that, uh, my, my dad was someone who would show up really beautifully when I was quote unquote, the good girl, when I was behaving and showing up in the way that he liked. And if there was ever a time that I was not, you know, and I E being a teenager, like I was never doing anything that I think was particularly, you know, out there, but you know, if I was, um, engaging in a way that he didn't like, then he would withhold love and communication Mm -hmm. from me, oftentimes giving me the silent treatment for days or weeks on end. And I started to learn that when I was quote unquote, easygoing, that was my connection to presence, love, communication. And when I was more difficult, quote unquote, that was going to lead to disconnection or the absence of love. And it went really well, hand in hand with the role that I had taken on. I'm fine. I'm good, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Cause it was like, okay, well now just be an easygoing person and you can have love and presence and connection as well. Right. And so just so fascinating again, to just think of like what those childhood experiences are that create the conditions of operation for us as adults today. Yeah. And I think we did touch, we, we did talk about belonging wound. That is the second wound that you teach yeah. about belonging. Mm-hmm. wound. I want to belong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you talk about this dynamic on how it's human nature for us to choose acceptance and belonging mm-hmm. over mm-hmm. authenticity. Yeah. Um, and a quote that I wrote down was as a kid, you don't have a say in the beliefs you're given fitting in is the golden ticket. 
Like mm-hmm. it's about, and when it, when you're, when you're talking about your belonging in a family, you're, you're, you're given your beliefs, right? Like mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're yeah. being, you're like saturated with all the, what, what yeah. your this is what we do. Like, this is what yeah. we believe. This is how we act. Mm-hmm. And some of it's just, you know, family traditions and a, a lot, mm-hmm. and some of it's really good, good things. Right. Of but then there are things that, for instance, when the story that you tell about, um, this boy who turned mm-hmm. into a man, of course, and he was mm-hmm. gay and his, and he was not, it, it was not a safe place for him to be himself. He could not mm-hmm. be his authentic self. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was having to choose between the group compared right. to himself, authentic right. self versus attachment and attachment mm. one. Yeah. Most, I love right? what, um, Dr. Gabor Mate says, right. It's like, these yeah. are, are our two core needs as babies, as children, right. It's like authenticity and attachment, right. But when attachment is at risk, right? We will trade our authenticity for it, right? Because it's the lifeline and they both are in their own right. But as babies, as kiddos, right? Attachment, right? Because that's our, that's our emotional safety, our physical safety, our, you know, spiritual safety, you know, everything, right? So we, we must trade authenticity in order to have attachment. And so if we grew up in a family system, and I also talk about societal systems, right? Of like how we have to navigate the world at large to quote unquote belong, to quote unquote feel safe, um, you know, that, that requires us to shift ourselves. And we often become inauthentic in that space if what we're trying to preserve is love, connection, presence, et cetera. Yes. A belonging wound yeah. can show up later in life. Right. You do talk, you talk about that. Yes. Um, a community. So that is that. So it's not just like, you know, we we are talking about family of origin, but our wounds can absolutely, they, they can be formed at any points in our lives. Absolutely. The first time anything significant happens that sort of shifts the trajectory and that can happen at any point in our lives. Of course, this book does focus mostly yeah. on what happens in our family of origin, but absolutely, right? Because the first time we might experience something might have been in our teenage years. It might be in our young adult life and it takes shape and form and sets us on a very different path than the one that we were on before. And so, yeah, we're not limited just to the family of origin. But that said, usually when we have some type of a sensation present day, it's likely like that we're going to be able to find some connection in the family of origin. Yeah. Okay. So the third is prioritization wound. Yeah. I want to be prioritized. Mm -hmm. And you, you give an example of sharing a story of one of your clients whose Mm -hmm. mom was really depressed Mm -hmm. and it was this little girl's job Mm -hmm. to really tend to her mom who was, Mm -hmm. who was depressed. And her dad would say, be good, be happy, go cheer your Mm -hmm. mom up. Right. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's it's like, she's put in this place, this role of you're not the priority as a little girl Mm -hmm. that needs Mm -hmm. attention. Your mom is not doing well and we have to tend to her. So the priority wasn't on caring and tending to the little girl that needed that. Right. There's so many things that can be yeah. take over in or, the Or or like you said, like so, some some people have like there's that one story <laughs> that you have about um it was a little, a, a boy whose mom had two jobs. And I think this mm-hmm. is very this is common. Both parent both mm-hmm. parents are working. Maybe yeah. you're the one that has to get yourself home from school, feed mm-hmm. yourself, feed the siblings dinner before the parents mm-hmm. come home. So you really it's not like this is the function of the family, but it's not and right. it's not their, your fault. There's no fault here, no, right? But it's no, like exactly. you, weren't like pri- you weren't made a yeah. parent. Sometimes wounds happen without there being any type of malicious intention, yes. right? Like, of course, sometimes we look and we're like, wow, that's clearly negligence. Wow, that's clearly abuse. Yeah. But oftentimes, right, there's these stories that are just like, ah, oh, these, are, these are just the circumstances of life. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's even harder, right, when we know that a parent worked their tail off, when a parent sacrificed everything for us uh, to be able to come into contact with the fact that there still might be pain there. You know, that part is so hard because we hold them in such a high regard. We love them so deeply. 
yet there can still be a wound there. And yes. yeah, with prioritization, right at the core of it, it's, I want to know that I am important and I want to know that I can be a priority in your life, or I want to be a priority in your life. And whether it's addiction that takes over, whether it's a mental health challenge that takes up space. I think that's what you were you know, talking about with the, with the little girl whose mom became depressed at a certain point, And that became the thing that, you know, the family was so focused mm-hmm. on, um, whether it's a parent who is focused on dating, whether it's a couple that has been in high conflict and that's the thing that's been the priority for two years, you know, sometimes yes. it's ongoing. Sometimes it's sort of this acute moment that, that where it happens, but, you know, to think about what else. Oh, and of course I should certainly mention this because this is a really common one, right? Is a parent who prioritizes work over yes. the child. You know, and that's, that's one that we see so often, right? Your work is more important than showing up for my recitals, for my, my games, uh, for me, for to be, you know, present to my emotions. Right. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. so, um, this, uh, clients in the, in the book, her name is Isabel. Mm -hmm. So it, as an adult and in her relationship with her partner, it was this prioritization wound that was on that she didn't realize until she worked, started working with you yeah. was showing up in her relationship in the fact mm-hmm. that she didn't feel prioritized with her partner. She, and, yeah. and her behaviors became quite controlling, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like her friend, want, her, 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 sorry, her partner wanted autonomy and like some independence and being like, right. I just want to hang out with my friends right. and without you sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be able to, I don't want you be, sorry, I don't want you to be like checking up on me every, mm-hmm. like when are you coming mm-hmm. home and, and feeling like I'm not prioritizing you. Right. Right. Sometimes we try, sometimes we try to force ourselves into prioritization, right? If I can control you, then I can be the priority. And that's just the illusion of it, right? Is, is that's actually not how we're going to tend to a prioritization wound. Their case in particular is really fascinating because, um, Isabel, the, the woman you're talking about, the little girl that we were just talking about too, uh, there was a moment for a period of time in her life where she was the priority. She was the That's focal right. point. And then it shifted. And with Josephine, um, with her partner, Joe, she, they both came over from Spain uh, yes. for grad school. And for a period of time, they were, uh, Isabel felt like the priority and then something shifted. And so this mm. was a really interesting case because it wasn't just, Ooh, here's the prioritization. When it, it really developed in mm. a very similar way. I am a priority to you. And then all of a sudden I no longer am right. There's yes. this, there's this massive shift that shift that takes place in the relationship. And so it was so fascinating to be able to connect to that origin pain from the past. And then to begin understanding that we can't control our way to prioritization. We can't brute force our way. We can't make you know, uh, Joe just respond to text messages within a period of time and, you know, throw up, throw anything up against the wall to see what would stick. Right. It really required us to go back into that origin pain that had never been tended to when Isabel was a little girl and to really witness that pain and grieve the pain so that again, it wasn't in the driver's seat in the same way it had been because it was going to it was going to push that relationship further and further and further apart. You can't yes. force a person to prioritize you. And even if you successfully force a person to, it will not be something that you trust because on some level you really do understand that it's not coming from a genuine, authentic place in the other person. So it never actually heals the wound. Yeah. Wow. Um, I love it. So, okay. <laughs> so, so the next one is a trust wound. Yeah. And so this, um, you say when someone you love betrays you, it can cause you to question everything in your world. Of course. Mm -hmm. course. And so you, you talk about, um, this is, this is somebody named Troy Mm -hmm. whose mom divorced and she remarried. Um, and his stepdad came with kids. Mm -hmm. So they Mm -hmm. were blending blended family. And no matter what Troy did as a little boy, it was like, he was to blame. He wasn't, Mm -hmm. his mom wouldn't stick up for him which I think that is, that's really hard. It's like, he was, he was always like the bad guy or the odd man out in the family and just feeling like, 
you know, I, I, I don't like the, the person who I trust the most is my mom to stand up for me is just not taking my side. And it just, it, it, you, you know, there's different elements to trust, but mm -hmm. you know, you talk about betrayal, you feel betrayed mm -hmm. and deceit, deceit yep. can show up, um, creating a trust wound, abandonment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little bit about trust yeah. wounds? Yeah. I mean, trust of course is so nuanced. Um, yes. you know, sometimes again, there's sort of like, there might be an outrageous event that takes place that, um, really shakes a relationship with trust and other times. And I think this is a great example that you're giving, um, with Troy's case, it's, it's a little bit more subtle. Um, and as you said, right, there was a ending to the relationship. Uh, she remarries. Um, he has a stepfather, two sons. The stepfather always has loyalty to the two sons, always takes their sides. Troy's the one that's always at fault, but mom never steps in to have Troy's back. And, you know, so a little bit more subtle, but it was a rupture of trust for him. And as you said, if I can't even trust my mom to have my back, who yes. can I trust? Who can I trust? Troy, as a little boy, turns into a man and he's presenting with conflict with his partner, comes in and is like, you know, my partner doesn't have my back at parties. You never take my side, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, sometimes we have repetition that's just so obvious and you're like, well, <laughs> here's the link. Yeah. Other times it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more tricky, but you know, they were playing something out that was so clearly connected to this origin pain, this origin wound with trust and wanting in Troy, wanting his partner to just side with him, have his back, agree with him, even when Troy was behaving or say behaving in certain ways. Yeah. Or saying and his partner was like, I'm not going to stand up for you in that case. Cause you were yeah. not in the right. Like I, right, that would right. not be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but there's also in another great example. Um, I talk about, uh, her in the beginning of the book, um, this woman was coming in and she was trying to decide whether or not to continue on with a relationship. It was getting to the point of engagement. Yes. And Clyde. He, she, she said with Clyde, sweet Clyde, <laughs> yes. right? She was saying, you know, Clyde is this incredible man. There's nothing wrong, but I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I start poking around. Well, when has the shoe dropped? Be, when has the other shoe dropped before? Yes. Has it dropped in other uh, romantic relationships? Has it dropped in family of origin? You know, she's like really protective. No, I don't know why you want to go there. I don't know why you want to explore that. And then eventually in our therapy, we come to find out, um, um, and, and she was someone who presented my, my family was amazing. I really had a great childhood. I don't think you're going to find anything there. And finally we get to this point where she reveals to me the first time she's ever spoken this out loud to anyone that when she was a, a teenager, she had come across emails between her father and some woman who wasn't her mother. And he had been having an affair for a really long time. And it shattered this image yes. that she held of her father. Um, this, this man whom, whom she thought was, you know, he was home every night by a certain time, always eating dinner with his family, presented loving everyone and just being this wonderful human. And she could not understand how this had happened. And so this other shoe dropping really originated from here's my father. I hold him on this pedestal. Here's the family I think I have. They had kept an, a, a secret um, from the entire family. She had never shared this with anyone. It was almost like she had absorbed it as if nothing had happened because she needed to continue on. Yes, and, and he also, mm -hmm. he said to her, we cannot tell your mom or your sister. Yeah, please don't this tell is, them. Yeah. This yeah. is a secret you have to, you have to keep. Otherwise the family yeah. will fall apart. What right. a thing to put on a child so much to put on a child. And it really, yeah. it, she had never said it out loud until no. she had said it to me. And we were then able to see that this fear, right, that something was going to go wrong, that she was going to find something out about Clyde and really any previous relationship she had been in um, besides Clyde, she would always terminate relationships yeah. before they got to that point. And that was her way of protecting herself from the fear of having trust be shattered yet yes. again. But she had no clue that this is what was running her decisions as it pertained to her relationships. All right. And so it's just, it's, 
this is fascinating work. You know, I, it is I, I love my job. I love this work. I think it's so important. Again, like we said at the beginning, you know, this isn't meant to go hang out in your childhood for years on end, but it is to say, we have to take a peek because there's stuff that has happened that plays some type of role in the way that we operate today, the patterns that we get into, the types of fights that we have, the things that yes. make us reactive, right? There's lots of sure tell signs that we might have an origin wound, but if we can just get curious, and I think, you know, I use a lot of people's stories in the book as well as my I really, own. Because I, I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think storytelling is such a beautiful way to land something for others. Cause sometimes it's easier to see ourselves in someone else first than it is to just do a full analysis of ourselves. And so yeah. I love the storytelling in this book because I really think you will find yourself in someone or you'll find a, your partner in someone. Um, and it will resonate with you on some level, but yeah, That's though absolutely. Troy and this woman are really good examples of the way that uh, a trust wound can show up in our adult relationships and really stir some stuff up. Yeah. And so the fifth wound we talked about in the very, in the beginning was a, yeah. a safety wound. Yes. And, you know, you, you know, you say that parents, which is the truth, right? Parents are meant to protect, respect, mm -hmm. be attuned to advocate for and set rules and boundaries to maintain your safety. Mm -hmm. And if you think about all of those examples, um, if, if those, if those things are missing, then you're not going to feel safe. And that's how mm -hmm. you know, that wound can absolutely originate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, when, so then <laughs> when we talked about all the wounds and we're, the, the time is going by so fast, of course, a lot of the book is about healing your, mm -hmm. is healing the wounds. Mm -hmm. And so you've got a healing practice, each of the chapters yeah. that we, so each of the wounds, you've got a healing practice for mm -hmm. diving in and how to really unearth and, mm -hmm. and then obviously tend to and, and, and work at healing these wounds. Mm -hmm. And so number one is naming the wound, identifying yeah. which, which wounds you have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Naming, identifying what the wound is for you. For some of us, it might just be like, yeah, I have a worthiness wound. For some others, you might feel like you get even more specific with the wound. You might use more language to describe that wound. Yeah. Um, naming, and you started off this way. I've, I've identified some of my wounds. Right? Yeah, I you know, know I have. And you know what, you know what yeah. one of mine was? You know what one of mine was? Yeah. yeah. Is, um, cause I was like, I wrote, I wrote them down in my book with a uh -huh. highlighter too. Um, <laughs> I felt like I, like I was not able, I wanted what, what something I wanted in a, that I did not get at a mm -hmm. certain time in my life was I just wanted to be a kid. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was put in this position that I had to be the grown up mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. And like my, my mom and my dad were, mm -hmm. would both put me in the middle of their mm -hmm. conflict. Yep. Robin, I need you to talk to your dad about this, mm -hmm. right? So I'd be going over and talking to dad about this. Okay. My mom needs this amount of money. <laughs> okay. And then my dad would say, okay, well you tell your mom this. Okay. Mm -hmm. There I go back over here and I'm talking to my mom about what my dad just said. Yeah. So right. I was what put in this you... position mm -hmm. of like mediator. Are you kidding yeah. me right now? Like you guys should be hiring mediator. <laughs> I'm your, I'm your like right. eight year old your daughter. Right. <laughs> it's just like, that's not cool. Yeah. And no but way. that's it, right? Like you, yeah. what you needed was not prioritized. Right? Yes. It's like, so I, I identified it. I'm like prioritization mm -hmm. wound. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yes. And I know. Yeah. And then I it's thought amazing. about how my husband and I are, you know, in, in our conflicts. Now that I've read this book and I'm working through it and really, really thinking about it, I'm like, uh, and yet, and then one of the tools that you, you teach is like using words to describe what you're, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, mm -hmm. right? Your, what is it? You like, um, narration, narrating what a the narrate. experience. Yeah. So mm -hmm. right now I'm not feeling prioritized <laughs> in yes. this way, right? Uh -huh. And yeah. I, and I'm realizing that that's the, actually where it's coming from. Like that right. is like the, the underlying feeling is like, I'm mm -hmm. not feeling that I'm a priority Beautiful. in this example. Right. And so I'm having to go back to, okay, Robin, but this is from your childhood. This mm -hmm. is where this is coming from. Mm -hmm. And in some ways I'm blowing it out of proportion. That's another thing that people mm -hmm. do. 
-hmm. It's like your, um, your reaction is not aligned with the experience that you're having. Right. So you, you can tend to blow things out of proportion because it's not related to exactly the experience you're having. It's related to the the wound that you, <laughs> all the experiences you had <laughs> up to this yes. date. Right. Yes. Yeah. Which makes it make sense when we have that context, but without that context, it can feel really disarming and confusing to the other person. It's, you know, there's just so we can name it to the listener, right? Is that, yes. yeah, there's naming and identifying the wound. Yes. We then move into witnessing that. So for me, and you'll see this in the origin healing practice that I offer, right, is that there's a real need to witness the pain, to not bypass it, to not avoid our way through it, to not find ways to dismiss it or intellectualize it or invalidate it, right? Many of the things that we talked about earlier, right? To actually witness the pain, we can do that for ourselves. And I highly, highly, highly recommend that. Or we can also have, you know, partners or friends or just pe trusted people in our corner do some of that witnessing. So we get deep into that in the book and really understanding what that looks like. And yeah. then the next step is the grieving process, right? Which is really allowing ourselves to feel deeply for the loss that took place, right? Whether it's the loss of not feeling worthy or prioritized, for example, or whether it's the loss of the self that had to adapt or adjust ourselves in order to try to get what it is that we wanted or needed at that point, and really just tending to those emotions, letting them take up space. And then the fourth step is the pivot, um, yes. which is about really laying down the new track, right? To not let our wounds drive the show, to not let our wounds take control always and forever, right? The pivot is like, okay, I'm taking the wheel back, right? And I yes. am going to exactly like you said, I'm going to have a different conversation with my husband about what's happening, right? Instead of just being in conflict, I'm actually going to be able to say, you know, I don't feel prioritized right now. And, you know, why this work is so important. Um, and especially for, for relationships, right. Is that when we can understand each other's origin pain and stories a lot more makes sense, right? So yes. instead of getting yes. looped in the conflict, right. You're able to tell your, your partner, you know, I was always a kid who was in between my parents. They were constantly asking me to do things for the other person and, you know, be the mediator when I didn't want to be the mediator. And it robbed me of the experience that I wanted to have. And no one cared enough. No, everybody else's stuff was more important than seeing that Robin didn't want to be here, that Robin didn't want to do this, that Robin just wanted to be a kid and have freedom and ease in her life. Right. And so when X, Y, and Z happens in our relationship, oof, yeah. Right. It's like, I feel that, right. That's the sensation that comes up. Yes. I want to feel like my experience is important to you and matters to you and that you can prioritize that sometimes. Right. Yes. And to begin to have that conversation, right. And instead of the same old conflict that we might get into. And, you know, in the book, I talk about how the unhealed origin wounds will show up in the dysfunction around, you know, conflict or, you know, communication falling boundaries apart or boundaries, right? Those yep. are the three main ways that I, you know, bring it to life. And I love those chapters. I think those chapters are so powerful to see it play out in real life scenarios of like, right, if I don't tend to this, if I leave this wound unresolved, here's the way it has a chance to play out in conflict, in setting or not setting a boundary in, you know, different types of communication that we might encounter engage in. And yeah, I found, I find that section to be really powerful stuff. I, I love it. And you know, the, um, you talk, you talk about this many times throughout the book about, and, and in the end too, around, um, you know, making changes in ourselves and our relationships, but also this is generational change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because if you, you know, it's like our parents' wounds were passed down to us, which we, if unhealed, will pass down to our children and on and on. Mm -hmm. And so there's like this bigger responsibility. It's, I, I just think this is why we're in this business. This is why we do what we do is all about relationships and how right. very, very, very important they are in our lives. Um, mm -hmm. it's such a, such an incredible book. And I'm just, I've so loved our time together, Vienna. And I know everybody has to get a copy because the, the healing work is really in the practice that you teach and the step-by-step mm -hmm. -step, and you have a, you have a very, a very doable, um, powerful healing 
practice that you can, that people can implement to get through, to go through it. I feel like I'm at the very beginning stages of the, like, okay, I'm naming, I'm witnessing. I Uh might be in the grieving stage right now. (laughs) (laughs) You're doing it. I'm doing it. Yeah. That's it. Bit by bit. And you'll come into contact with more and more and more. I always do. Every time I go back and be like, okay, what was my childhood like? You know, it's like, I'm like, ah, there's the thing or, oh, here's, I didn't realize this before. And I think that's the gift, you know, in some ways, <laughs> quote unquote, the gift of life or like cool yeah. gift. Thanks a lot, life. Yeah. But right. This gift, as we continue to move through our lives, right. We come into contact with new things over and over and over again. And those things, they will direct us back to the origin wounds. And if you're willing to look right, if you're willing to notice, Ooh, I had a reaction there. Ooh, I blew some things out of proportion. Ooh, I can give advice to people, but I can't implement it or take it myself. Right. It's like you start to notice some of these things, then the antennas come out, right? You must get curious to be like, okay, what is familiar about this? Right. And working backwards into that space, right? Like what's actually happening here that's needing tending to, because I'm having a response to something that is letting me know that something else wants my attention. That's right. The trigger. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's, it's really is like this, um, yeah. this flag that you say, put it, you put it, fl- the it. Fl- flag in the sand. And it's like, yeah. this is where we need to focus right now. We need to stay here and tend mm-hmm. to this. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, the title of your book, the origins of you, and you really, that's really, you say that the subtitle is the origins of you will teach you how to break family patterns and help you liberate the way you live and mm-hmm. love. And I do believe that that is the powerful work that you're doing, Vienna. And I thank you. I thank, thank you for your time. I think, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> so nice to be in conversation with you. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Please visit realloveready.com to become a member of our community. Submit your relationship questions for our podcast experts at reallovereadypodcast at gmail.com. We read everything you send. Be sure to rate and review this podcast. Your feedback helps us get you the relationship advice and guidance you need. The Real Love Ready podcast is recorded and edited by Maya Anstey. Transcriptions by otter.ai and edited by Maya Anstey. We at Real Love Ready acknowledge and express gratitude for the Coast Salish people, the stewards of the land on which we work and play, and encourage everyone listening to take a moment to acknowledge and express gratitude for those that have stewarded and continue to steward the land that you live on as well.